Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the most epic chess recap videos that you will ever watch. It is the third round of action at the Singfield Cup 2022. There are some of the world's best players, Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana, Jan Nepomnici, Ali Reza Ferruja, you name them, they are probably there. Uh, the reason why this recap is going to be epic is because today we witnessed an absolutely historic result involving one Magnus Carlsen. Uh, I'm going to take you through all of the games of the round, timestamps are on the video player, but uh, I've named the video what I've named it and hopefully I haven't changed the title out of... Uh, you know, uh, whatever, out of some people getting mad because, well, you'll find out. You'll find out. You'll find out why the video is named what it's named. Don't get up in arms. Don't get upset. Here we go. Mamidyarov plays the move knight f3 against Maxim Vashir Legrov. This is our first game of the day. And this is a queen's gambit accepted, okay? Uh, and the variation that Mamidyarov chooses here is to not play any of the other plethora of main lines, but he plays the endgame line. And this is just a very boring little system where black is slightly behind in development and has a king in the center of the board, but it's all symmetrical, right? And white tries to prove a little bit of a microscopic advantage by maybe grabbing the bishop. But it's really difficult for white to move this bishop out. Like, white can play b3 here to try to play bishop a3. But it's not going to do anything. I'm just going to play b4. That's not going to work. So instead of that, we have b4. And white tries to develop like this. The problem is that black's just going to put his rooks in the center. Like, both rooks in the center. Like, the position plays itself if you're MVL. And for a half a move, Mamijarov grabs a pawn... And, like, if you were to grab the pawn and run out of the store, like, you know, shoplifting, if he just grabs the pawn and escapes, it's going to be bad. But MVL just closes the shop door, and, yeah, now Mamidyarov is going to have a very stern talking to for looting the pawn, right? And so what has to happen here is the bishop is escaping out the side, but it's going to run into a lot of police, get forced down here, and now black just basically has both these bishops standing here, and they're not participating in the game. So it's four pieces playing for black, only like two-ish, two and a half playing for white. And what ultimately happens is Maxime goes for the end game where he's a pawn down, but it's basically impossible for white to defend his pawns. He can play rook to a1, but he just has no moves after that. And instead of that, Mamidyarov does it this way, and a bunch of pawns fall off, and it's four on four. And rather than even playing anymore, we have a draw. Now, that, this is not the compelling part of today's recap. This is a two and a half minute appetizer. It's like if you go to a restaurant with a nine, nine course tasting menu, one of those fancy places, your first thing is like one bite, right? That's how they do it. Okay, great. Now, we have four really, really epic games today. First of all, we have this game between Lanier Dominguez Perez and Jan Nepomnishi. We have two guys who are very good at the Knight Orf Sicilian and they choose to play a Knight Orf Sicilian. It's amazing to see this opening alive and well. Uh, bishop e3, e5, and rather than playing knight b3, which is the main line of the English attack, Lanier plays knight f3, and we saw Hikaru play this during the candidates and get a couple of very nice games, like against Duda, for example. But in, that, uh, in the candidates, he played h3 a lot. He was playing this system and then playing bishop c4. He was never playing h3 right away. Um, sorry, he was not playing bishop c4 right away, whereas Lanier does it like this. He never plays h3. Like, ever. He just plays the game. Now, black has a couple of options here, but queen c7, knight d7 is not as popular. We've gone from about 100% of our games to about 5 to 8%. Very few games have reached here, and by about move 12, uh, my man Nepo did something so crazy. He played knight d7. The reason why that move is crazy is because now, for instance, if white played here, Black can play with, with the knight, right? When, when you do this, who guards this? I have a serious question. Who guards that pawn? If knight to c5, bishop takes c5, and then you take, the rook can guard, but there's all sorts of weird stuff here, and you're kind of paralyzed. You're getting in the way of both your pieces. Jan guards with the king. When I saw this, I was like, bleh, bleh, what? And then Lanier just improved his position, and... Like, black has no moves, it feels like. Just nothing. White is going to play a few more moves, and surely black is just dead, right? Surely. Gotta be. Gotta be just done. Over. And, well, I mean, not really. It looks ridiculous, but somehow it's not the case, okay? I, I think Lanier somewhere here had to do something different. Like, he, he had to play rook b4, and then he had to play a couple of waiting moves. Stockfish was giving some random lines. So actually, Nepo's idea is very interesting until he does this. 
And now white is totally winning. So what, what Jan didn't want to do is play this endgame. Jan thought this endgame was bad for him because look at his pieces. Everything is stuck behind everything else. Nothing can move. It's only white playing for a win here. So Jan was like, all right, you're going to take this. I'm going to take your knight. And here Jan had about a mi an hour versus 14 minutes. Linier here is winning if he finds bishop takes d6. The point is that if you take this, I have check and I'm either winning your rook uh, or we're going for this end game where after a long series of exchanges, which is not that hard at that level to see, after a long series of exchanges, white is playing for a win. Black is going to win this pawn back, but apparently this end game, six on five, is totally winning for white. And if bishop takes d6 and instead of queen d6, there's this move, apparently there's another sequence of moves here that just results in a totally winning position for white. Now, I don't know what Lanier did in C because the truth is rook takes d2 is a very natural recapture, but this is not the world's most difficult move at 2750. They both missed it. Lanier did this. And Lanier is on, he's not given another chance. This king covers all the infiltration spot. Lanier, Lanier continues to pressure, but he ultimately ends up snatching a, 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 a draw out of the jaws of victory as they say. I mean, it just becomes a rook endgame and it is unwinnable and it, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but Jan ultimately gets here and this is just the draw as we just saw in the Mamit Yarov game. But what a, what a crazy blind, like oversight there by both players. I mean, Bishop D6, it's a, it's a, it's a natural move because it's a desperado. You're going to move, you're going to lose your Bishop anyway. So you might as well sacrifice it, right? And you just have to look at this, I guess. Those are the only two lines and they just both missed it. It happens. It's just crazy, though, that it, that it happened. So Jan played with fire the whole day. He still gets out with the draw. Good for him. Good result. I mean, considering, you know, the game was topsy-turvy. Uh, but that could have been decisive. And now, now we just have three banger games. All right, so if you watch these recaps from start to finish, you're the best. I love you if you just jump around. This is game three, and this one was nuts. So it was an E4, E5, and rather than doing all the modern stuff, like playing... Uh, like playing, you know, C3, D3, all this like, you know, little baby stuff here. Now, Ali Reza's is like, bro, I'm gonna play some sideline and then I'm gonna put my knight here. That's just not what the top guys do. They don't put the knight on C3 because it's not sophisticated, you know? The knight is supposed to, the knight is supposed to make multiple moves, maneuvering. Ali Reza's is like, I don't care about all that. And Levon doesn't need a second invitation to the party. Like, if you're having a party and you invite Levon, he's not going to be one of those friends that's like, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll go, maybe... I'll... No, bro, he's going to party. Knight a5, and by move 7, we have a position that's never happened before at top level. We have a position that went from literally millions of games played to I've never seen this game in any top level database. It's never happened. It's just never happened. Ali Reza puts all his pieces on very active squares, and then here... Levon does something I don't understand. He plays this, which I understand, but then he plays this. Now, look folks, here one of two things happens. White retreats, game goes on, white sacrifices and white wins. There is no third option. There's no way white sacrifices and then, well, black could win, I suppose. But, like, you either retreat or this works. So all the rest goes for it. Now there's a threat, queen f3, so queen, king g7. And now it's basically the question of, is Levon right or is he insane? Ali Reza plays f4. Logical move, two threats. f5 to push the bishop back, which just wins. Like, for example, this is just completely winning for, right? Completely winning. Uh, next threat is to play like queen g3 and just get to the king. You know, get to the king, take, etc. Rook on the f-file. So, takes. Doesn't recapture. Look at this very interesting idea. He wants to play here, okay? C6. Now, B4! Bishop comes in to try to glue everything together. Rook F1. Ali Reza's just straight up down a piece. But black has no moves. King G6. The king is playing offense. What world are we living in? H4. Now the king is just in the line of sight of this. So, Levon sacks his bishop back to try to, you know, create a little counterplay in the center. Ali Reza just moves. F4 is about a fall. Dude, the king is one of Black's most active pieces. What is going on? I'm telling you, Levon doesn't need a second invitation to party, but he's partying a little bit too much. Rookie 8, now it's time to, you know, hunt the king into the corner. And we're forgetting something. 
One guy still has the right to what? Yeah, castle. There are now 22 points of material ready to swarm the Black King. Black's position is ill-equipped to deal with it. Knight takes e4, I don't care that I'm down a... Am I even down a pawn? I'm not even down a pawn. Knight back. Ali Raza here actually missed Knight takes d5, which was winning on the spot. Pawn takes, rook f7. And I think, uh, like, if king g6 attacking this, he missed rook takes d5, which is kind of crazy. Uh, hitting the queen, and if something like queen h4, uh, white just wins with queen f3. This is the most important move. It's the only winning move. Defending this, and also just threatening, like, queen f5 stuff. And black has a check. You have rook d1, and uh, the game is over. So actually kind of nuts, but Ali Reza missed the win. He went this way, and now apparently king g8, according to the engine, maybe holds? Because there's, like, this defense, and whoops, could have been to a rook endgame as well. So, and listen, it's far from perfect, but the initiative rages on. White continues to try to make progress, and I think Levon just got such a negative start in this game, he was always fighting back. All right, and Ali Reza made an inaccuracy, and it still didn't matter, because the Black King never got comfortable. There are still 19 pieces of, 19 points of material roaring. Look at this. He has a triple stack, all right? And then he plays rook f7, rook a3, check here, check, lights out, boom, headshot, done, pound for pound, ain't nothing. Leon Edwards in the octagon after the Kamara Usman knockout. By the way, that surreal gun fight was insane. That second round was unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's over because after uh, queen takes f7, white wins with rook 1 f7, king g6. I don't want to take just yet, but you have this move, deflecting the king away from the rook, and then you would win the game. Ali Reza just beat Aronian. Now, in Aronian's defense, g5 was like, was, was wild stuff. I mean, look, in the second round, I was kind of like, damn, it's a shame Aronian didn't take a risk against Magnus, right? This is chess at the highest level. Chess at the highest level is a heavyweight fight. In that game against Magnus in round two, it was very boring, right? Look what happens if you try to get creative or provocative at the highest level. You throw one punch bad, it's just, I didn't hit, it, ooh, that was a good sound. It's just, it's over, it's done. So it's such a risky game and everyone is so good. Great win from Ali Reza. And um, yeah, I mean, crazy. Like chess is just, chess is hard. now. The penultimate game uh, of this round, this game actually finished after the Magnus game, but listen, best for last, main event, UFC, right? Gotta save the best for last. Um, this one was a Petrov uh, between Wesley So and Fabiano Caruana, and it was a uh, mainline Petrov. This has all happened before, but this is a sideline. Bishop D3 is like the cool coffee shop that just opened up, all right? Like, you know, there's all these lines, D4, D5, C4, you got your, you know, you got your Starbucks of the world. This is like... The, 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 this is like the they know your first name and they give you neighborhood suggestions and they got good vibes and random indie music plays on Spotify. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's one of those things. All right, they come in, you know, they see you coming in. They know when you come in. They say hi to your dog. I'm speaking kind of from personal experience here. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this is a completely symmetrical position where white has the tiniest of advantages, the slightest of advantages, right? And he's gonna just... And it was just gonna play, man. man. Fabi plays g5. Okay, g5 is pretty provocative. All right. And uh, knight f1. A couple moves later, we're gonna have that bishop get taken. And from the early stages of the game, it seems like black actually has the bishop pair in a very nice position. Here's the problem this is a little much. Okay. And on top of that, you have this weakness. And if you spend any time defending this, suddenly I kick the defense out from your position. You just can't defend everything. So you have problems on the king side, the center, and the queen side. You overextend it a bit, so you gotta guard the center, lose this pawn. Now, you do get some counterplay on my, on, my, on my side over here. Now, here, I do not understand why Fabi didn't take this. There's some variations here, like knight c4 is a very crazy move. If d c4, right, like this goes down. But instead of that, Fabi just says, to hell with that, I got f5 going on. All right, the, the, the queen starts coming back. Fabi is just, look at what, F Fabi's nuts. He's off the chain. He's Levon, but, I mean, he's just going bananas here. He's throwing punches and bunches. It's like Alvarez versus uh, Poirier, the second one, not the first one. This is just insane. What is happening here? 
It's just a waterfall of pawns to White's king. Wesley, though, Wesley is the king of seeing through opponent's aggression. He is so good at that. I've heard many people describe that. He's so good at just sniping, just a counter puncher. I don't know why I'm making so many fighting analogies today. I've been taking boxing classes. Maybe that's why. Wesley's so good, and he just drops his knight into the middle, and suddenly the attack for black has cooled off. And now we have queen a4. And if you take on e5, I'm going to get this pawn, and I'm going to cause you some problems. So you can't take that. So you gotta, you got to start using this pawn too. But the second you use that pawn, I got rook d2. Wesley's playing all the engine moves. Knight goes back. Queen comes forward. Here comes d4. Oh my goodness. e6! The best move. The only move. Why is that the best move? Because you need to bait the bishop forward. And then you take. And now you're ready to go here and here if black opens up the position. All right? Queen b6. No queen trade. That is once again the best move. He loses this but now queen e4, both sides have made 40 moves, 41, and now white must win this endgame. White is better, mainly because the black king is so open. And Wesley's gonna try his best. He guards his pawn, he gives a couple of checks, and there comes his knight, all right? Black has a really difficult time defending here because queen and knight play so differently. They put pressure in such different ways. Wesley's applying that pressure. G4 now, activating that, that, that pawn and maybe marching it down the board because queen e7 is always made. King f7. Another best move. A5. Another best move. Queen E5. Another best move. Stepping out of the pin and away, for, and away to safety. Another top engine move. D3. Queen into D6. Okay. We have Bishop F3. I mean, white is on the verge of getting mated. That's made in two. Check here. Check here. Check here. We're not going to repeat, right? Oh. Oh, and the king's going to run out over here. Poppy feels the heat. He's going to try to keep hunting the king, but there it goes. There goes the king behind the pawns. Knight f5. Check. 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 And there it is. And there it is all the way down. And the king shielded by his pieces made is unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Like, if you play queen d4 protecting that mate, I got this mate. Wesley played one of the most breathtaking games I've ever seen. He played this game at 99% over 70 moves. Like... I don't think he made an inaccuracy. This might have been one of Wesley's best games ever. I'm not even joking. Like, he's beaten better players in better moments. Like, he beat Magnus to win the Fisher Random World Championship. This was one of Wesley's cleanest games. He might not, he might not agree with me. Literally, he played the top line of the engine the whole game. If you're Fabi, how the hell do you even beat that? Like, you just saw what happens at the highest level when a guy, like, acts up like Levon, right? <laughs> Clobbered. How do you even, I mean, it's unbelievable. And now folks, whether or not you click the head to this game or you watch the entire recap, welcome to the namesake of today's recap. I don't even know where to start with this game. Let's just go. Magnus, Hans Niemann. Now, this was the matchup a couple of weeks ago in Miami at the FDX Crypto Cup. Hans won with black and then went to the camera and said the chess speaks for itself. He proceeded not just to lose the two out of the next three games to Magnus, he proceeded to lose every single future match that he played in Rapid. He ended that event with zero points, but he won a Rapid game in almost every matchup. He had interviews for days. He was talking about spending thousands of dollars on Uber Eats. He was talking about walking into the ocean and doing God knows what and never returning. And yet Hans Niemann's tied for first place. And he, now he's playing Magnus Carlsen. Magnus plays the G3 Nimso. All right, Bishop G2. And this line d5. Now, here there's a line that's very, very interesting. So th there's a line like knight f3 uh, by white, and then, you know, black takes this pawn and uh, tries to defend that pawn for the rest of, for the, for the, basically for the rest of the game. There's like all sorts of goofy lines here, like white can play for e4 later on. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the line is something like either queen c2, there's some knight d5 move, I don't even remember, it might be queen a4, yes, it's queen a4, knight d5, queen c2, uh, like knight c6, like some super complicated line, like bishop back to e7, trying, yeah, I think this is the line, knight b4, take, take, knight d3, I think this is the line, um, and this was in my prep, actually, but instead of that, Magnus plays it this way, he plays a3, so he doesn't play knight, he does this, Hans takes, Hans attacks the center, and we get the following position after, like, some moves. So we get queens off, very forcing line, this position. And this is where I booted up to the game. And I was like, what is going on? Like, 
I see an endgame. I'm like, oh, th this is my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, Magnus took Hans to an endgame where the engine thinks it's like slightly better, but it's not easy to play. And he's going to try to, you know, beat Hans with the pawn structure. And then I'm like, wait a minute. My Magnus, I'm wearing my Magnus glasses. You know how people say you see the world through rose glasses? I'm like, I'm seeing the world through Magnus glasses. Black is better. Like, Hans is not playing for a draw. Hans is going to put his rook on the open file. He's going to bring his knight. He's going to put his rook, hit that C pawn. And if Magnus tries to play passive defense with rook C1, he's going to play a 5, E4, bring his king. White has no play. What does Magnus do? Gives the pawn up. You could take it. Let's go bishop for knight. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be active. I'm going to create active play here and maybe still try to hold, right? I'm, I'm still going to try to hold this position. I'm still asking questions, but Hans Niemann is just a pawn up in the, tw in the 25th move against Magnus. What is going on? Huh? And, you know, I'm like, all right, well, Magnus got this, no problem. He's going to hold this, right? Rook b8. Rook e8. Suddenly, Hans is getting a lot of activity. And Hans plays this move. Now, that move is trying to break up Black's position. And it makes a lot of sense, because Black can't really hold his pawns together. There's just no way, right? So what does he do? Plays rook c5. It's a good move. Forces the bishop to move to a very passive square. Here comes the knight to c4. And now, the only move that Magnus has here is to do this. Magnus has to now defend this very bad rook endgame, which might still be lost, because Black is going to go rook a4, and then black is going to go, like, if white tries to win this pawn, he's going to go b5, and then win this pawn, and it's 2 on 0. Just 2 on 0. So, instead of that, Magnus plays a4. We have knight d6, and here the engine was giving minus 5. Mine, mine only says minus 1. The engine saw the future, which is what it does, and it was like, wait, black is lost. You know why black is lost? Because if black plays rook d8, e3! If rook d8, there's check, rook d1, and look at, this is disgusting! So all of a sudden, people are like, wait, Hans is winning. Hans is winning. Hans has to find rook c2 here. Instead, he plays this. And after rook d7, he goes for the same idea. We have king f1. Check here, rook c2. And we have this, rook e2 check, king g1. Now, it's, Hans got to play a couple more moves. He could have done this more cleanly. Could have done this more cleanly. He repeats one time. Is he going to make the draw? No. Draw declined. You have to play rook here, here, and bishop c4. This is apparently what the engine gives here to survive with white. Instead of that, Magnus, final move of the time control to get his bonus time on move 40, bishop d5. Hans plays rook d2. Check, king g6. Rook d7 back. But suddenly knight g5. Now, to the untrained eye, the move bishop f7 check wins the game. Because knight f7, rook d7, or rook d2. But to the trained eye, king f6 is the coldest of showers because this is hit and this is hit. And if you take, the knight jumps in and says, what's up? And that is actually what happens in the game. Bishop f7. But there is king f5 and all of a sudden Hans Niemann is just in a winning endgame. Magnus played rook d7, which, which I guess that was his idea. It's very tough to defend against rook and knight. You got rook e7, you got rook f4, but every endgame is most likely losing for white. But it's very, very tough to defend. He does it this way, and somehow this might be winning for black. Just like no questions asked. Magnus plays a5, locks the pawns. This is the only winning move now, king e5. Preventing the bishop from going to d5. We have this, check. King's got to part ways with one of the pawns. King plays f2, knight h2, there's this, he takes, the bishop is going to try to sneak in and win these pawns, but uh, it doesn't matter, you can go and win my pawns, I have knight f3, I have knight e5, and now I'm just going to push, Magnus wins all the pawns, but knight c6 wins the most important one, and even though the bishop is paralyzed, the bishop is paralyzing the knight on the edge of the board, the move h5, and h4 wins the game, Magnus plays bishop d5 and resigns. He plays the move and resigns. Why? Because h3, and there's nothing you can do. Like, king g1, black can win in a variety of ways. He can push his pawns like this, then he can hit the bishop. The bishop will have to go somewhere, and the knight will come in. And all, the only way that black screws this up is by playing this. If black sacrifice gets his pawns lost like this. Uh, otherwise, it's a completely winning position for black. Hans Niemann just beat the world champ. Hans Niemann just beat Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces. Not only does he have two and a half out of three, he just broke 2700 for the first time. 
This is Magnus's first loss with black in classical chess in four years. This is Magnus's lowest rated loss or second lowest rated loss. The only time he's lost to someone below 2700 in like 10 years. And on top of that, Hans Niemann, after this game was over, and this is why I named the video what I named it. I was not trying to insult, I was not trying to insult him. This is what Hans Niemann had to say. But I think, okay, even if there's a draw, yes. I think he's just so demoralized because he's losing to such an idiot like me, you know? It's just, uh, it must be embarrassing for the world champion to lose to me. I feel bad for him. Hans, how do you... Did you guys hear that? He just said, he's losing to an idiot like me. It must be embarrassing for the world champion to lose to an idiot like me. I love it. I love everything about it. It was an amazing 17 minute interview. It, it, he, he's not even being, he's being a sprinkle of inflammatory. Dude, that's like pure honesty right there. And Hans throughout that interview was like, I gotta keep working hard and I, you know, I gotta keep learning. I gotta keep getting better. You know, I, got, I barely got this opportunity. Hans Lehmann wasn't supposed to play this event. It was supposed to be Richard Report who was unable to travel to the United States for whatever reason and they brought in Hans Niemann. And now he beats the world champion with black. Huh? What just happened? The whole chess world just got shaken up. And Hans Niemann is 2702 and he's just, he's, he just said he's getting started. Folks, I don't think there's ever been a more interesting time for chess. Especially if you're interested in some of the young players of the world. Gukesh, Eric Geisi, Abdu Saturov, Hans Niemann, Vincent Keimer, Andrei Yasipenko. You name it. You name a player, they're probably interesting. Pragnananda, so much of India, but Hans is the most promising young player from the U.S. right now. I, what more can I say? The post-match the post interview was phenomenal. It was self-aware. It was witty. It was, I mean, I love it. I loved everything about it. And like I said, Hans likes to talk when the camera's on and the mic is on. And if he can back it up with results like today, oh, the chess world is in for a rude awakening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the recap. Let me know your thoughts in the comments on the interview. And uh, I'll see you for round number four. Get out of here.